please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The top story tonight, the government has announced a surprise bonanza for the money markets. Economic Affairs Secretary has released the borrowing plan for FI19, which is considerably lower than what it had borrowed in FI18. The centre is also confident of sticking to the 3.3% fiscal deficit target. Sapna Das, who was at that briefing, joins us now with more details. Sapna. It's a pretty positive announcement coming in from the side of the government. Basically, uh, this clearly indicates that uh, possibly in FI19, the overall borrowing requirement uh, as given in the budget numbers may be much lower than what the government may actually practically do. For instance, uh, you know, the small savings uh, kitty, for example, the government expects uh, some additional accretion over there. So against 75 odd thousand crores that they were planning to borrow from small savings, uh, you know, that is being stepped up to 1 lakh crore. That's the target that they're looking at right now. So to that extent, your borrowing will come down. 25,000 uh, crores of borrowing will be lesser in FI19 because the government will borrow the same amount from the small savings kitty. Uh, second, uh, uh, you know, basically in the buyback program, the buyback program has now been cut by another 25 odd thousand crores. Uh, you know, uh, the amount probably in the budget was somewhere around 28 to 30,000 odd crores. Uh, that has been now reduced by 25,000 crores. So again, additionally, you don't need that much of money to do the buyback in FI19. Now, generally buybacks happen in the second half, but broadly, uh, both these factors put together their expecting the overall borrowing to be lower by around 50,000 crores in FI19, and that's a big number. The budgeted number uh, is 6.05 6 lakh crores. So somewhere around 5.55 lakh crores is where they expect the number to settle in terms of the overall borrowing. Uh, now, second aspect, of course, this clearly indicates that the government is very uh, you know, serious about its fiscal consolidation plan. Probably they have a very credible plan in mind. Uh, uh, of course, they are going to stick to 3.3% as of now, but sometime uh, December, Jan, when they do the review uh, you know, towards the end of FI19, uh, you know, you may possibly see some change in the numbers in case uh, the other revenue stream is uh, buoyant enough. Apart from this, some other important decisions that have been taken is at the lower end of the, uh, you know, of the, of the bond market. One to four year papers are going to be introduced. Uh, this is going to be a first. Uh, so basically, they're trying to keep in touch. Uh, they're trying to attune themselves to the market demand for shorter tenor papers. Uh, even if you look at the uh, 10 to 14 year bucket, obviously, generally 52% of the borrowing used to happen uh, during you know, in those tenor papers. But that will now stand reduced to somewhere around 29 odd percent in FI19. So this clearly indicates the shifting uh, in the market that is happening and how government is trying to respond to that. Uh, uh, last but not the least, we also understand that some FPR-related decisions in terms of possibly the exposure uh, allowed uh, by foreign portfolio investors on the GSEC limits. Uh, some change is likely some, somewhere around April 1. Uh, that is what the release very clearly understand, uh, very clearly indicates. And last but not the least, you know, generally the borrowing program H1 has been front-loaded. 60-65 odd percent of the borrowing used to happen in the first half of the calendar. Uh, well, that now stands reduced to 47.5 percent. This is a big, uh, this is a big uh, change, uh, you know, as per what the trend had been so far. So again, 60 to 65 percent. Uh, they're looking at 47.5 percent uh, front loading or rather borrowing in H1. Now that again is a very good signal. Let's uh, wait and watch and see how the bond markets also now react to this. All right, Sapna, appreciate you joining us with that. Forget the Chinese retaliation. Tariffs on steel imports would do more harm than good to the U.S. economy. Strong words of criticism coming in from noted economist Larry Summers, who earlier served as America's Treasury Secretary. Summers was speaking exclusively to CNBC's Martin Soong in Beijing on the sidelines of the China Development Forum. He said that President Trump's decision to levy 25% tariff on steel imports was not prudent. He called it, and I quote, a bit of a stop or I'll shoot myself in the foot kind of strategy, end of quote. We also spoke with Nobel laureates Robert Schiller and Joseph Stiglitz. While Schiller warned of an immediate fallout of the U.S.-China trade tussle, Stiglitz said that American people are not with President Trump in his tariff tussle. Take a look. I think uh, there are important issues on both sides. We need to address them in some kind of broad strategic context. Uh, Ronald Reagan said about nuclear wars that they can never be won and must never be fought. I confess I have the same view of uh, trade wars. I don't see that the steel tariffs are a prudent bit of public policy. Forty times as many people work in steel using industries as in the steel producing industry. So I think that's a bit of a stop or I'll shoot myself in the foot kind of strategy. Immediate thing will be an economic crisis because these, these enterprises are built on long term planning. They've developed a skilled uh, workforce and uh, 
ways of doing things that uh, it, it, we have to rediscover these things it, 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 in whatever country, you know, after the imports are cut off. And uh, it's, it's just chaos. It will slow down development in the future if people think that this kind of thing is likely. I want to emphasize that it's just President Trump who is uh, challenging the international rule of law. The American people, mm -hmm. I think, are uh, not with Trump, or at least a very significant fraction of them are not. Okay. Uh, Trump only has about 30 some percent of support, uh, the lowest uh, any president has had in that part of his presidency. Well, Joseph Stiglitz there. Now, in a bid to fight pollution, the Supreme Court today proposed a hike in diesel prices for private cars. The top court also suggested imposing green cess on small and medium cars. Remember, the Supreme Court had earlier imposed a green cess of 1% on vehicles with an engine capacity of over 2,000 cc. Ashmit Kumar, who's been tracking those developments in court, joins us now with more details. Ashmit, what did the court have to say? <laughs> Well, indeed, the uh, Supreme Court was hearing the Delhi air pollution case and in doing so, clearly turning on the heat as far as diesel is concerned, diesel being uh, one of the more polluting fuels available as far as vehicular pollution is concerned. And now what's interesting is that the apex court in turning on the heat on diesel, importantly, has asked three key questions of the government. I'll take you through them one by one. First up, EPCA had raised concerns that diesel is a cheaper fuel as compared to petrol and hence, as a result, its use is incentivized. In response to these concerns, uh, what the apex court has done is that it has, it has asked the question of the government that while diesel hikes uh, for commercial vehicles can be ruled out, can there be a policy considered wherein there's a hike for diesel prices, at least with respect to use uh, by private vehicles? So that's a key policy shift uh, that the apex court appears to be mooting at this stage. That was question one. The second question is, uh, with respect uh, to the diesel cess, the green cess that has been levied, keep in mind uh, that under Justice Thakur, the Supreme Court had levied a 1% green cess on uh, diesel vehicles with an engine capacity of greater than 2,000 cc. Now, what's interesting is that the question that the Apex Court is now asking of the government is, can there be a similar cess levied on small and medium diesel cars? That's the second question. The third question is, uh, is with respect to the BS6 rollout. Now, the government has made its position clear that as far as Delhi NCR is concerned, as of 1st April 2018, BS6 fuel will be rolled out. The question that the Apex Court, however, is asking that, as we saw in the case of migration, from BS3 to BS4, can we see a similar rollout, not just in Delhi, but across 13 major metros as far as BS6 fuel is concerned? So three key questions being asked. The owners now and the government to come back with the answers. Back to you. All right, Ashmit, appreciate you joining us with that. Uh, action from the last three. The bulls making a powerful comeback in trade as indices rally more than a percent. The Nifty saw a sharp rally post 1.30 in the afternoon and the index ended with gains of over a percent. The Sensex also gained about 450 points. In the broader markets, the mid-caps up 250 points. Banks rallied over 2.5%, making it the biggest one-day gain for the banking stocks in about five months. It's time now for us to head into a break, but when we return, BJP and Congress trade allegations about their respective apps, sharing user data with third-party companies. More details when we return. Well, let's shift focus to the political fallout of the Facebook data breach. India's top two political parties in the midst of a data slugfest. On Friday last week, the French hacker, who goes by the Twitter handle Elliot Alderson, alleged in a series of tweets that the Narendra Modi app was sending user data to a third-party app in the U.S. without the consent of users. This personal data includes email IDs, photos, gender, and names of users. The French security researcher alleged that an American company called CleverTap was getting the personal data of the Namo app users. What followed was a series of tweets from Rahul Gandhi accusing the Prime Minister of giving away the data of those who downloaded the app to what he called are the Prime Minister's friends in American companies. But it's important to note that before the tweets from Alderson, the website associated with the Namo app said, your personal information and contact details shall remain confidential and shall not be used for any purpose other than communication with you. That was later changed to say certain user information may be shared with third-party services to offer a better user experience and that information 
information shared with third parties includes name, email, mobile phone number, device information, location and network carrier. The BJP's Amit Malviya admitted to CNBC TV 18 that they did share user data of the Namo app with an Indian company headquartered in the United States. However, he clarified that the BJP... Uh, is the one running the Namo app and not the Prime Minister's office. Meanwhile, Textile Minister Smriti Rani hitting back at Rahul Gandhi, referring to him as Chota Bhim, a popular cartoon character, defending the app and saying that it asks only for information that's commonly asked on other apps. She went on to say this is not snooping. Here's an interesting twist. Just hours after Rahul Gandhi's tweets, the Congress party took down its own app from the Google Play Store. The same after the online hacker who targeted the BJP accused the Congress of sending personal user data to Singapore. The Congress has denied those charges. Here's that war of words. Modi ji kar rahe hai nijta parwar. Ab ki baar data leak sarkar. The Modi government has to realize that this data belongs to India, to Indian citizens, not to the government, not to the ruling party. And because they have this propensity to shoot the messenger and ignore the message, I will call this Sarkar where IT stands not for information technology. IT has now begun to stand in this government for identity theft. Rahul Gandhi ji, yeh kehte hain ki namo app ke madhyam se in sabhi dataon ko America ke mitron ke paas Sri Narendra Modi ji bhej rahe hain. This is a classic case of technological illiteracy of Mr. Rahul Gandhi. As soon as the Bharatiya Janata Party revealed the truth of the Congress app, which was stealing the data of the people, it was proved by the Bharatiya Janata Party, immediately thereafter, the Congress Party downed its app from the Play Store. And you can catch more of that on a special discussion, The Data Wars, uh, that's coming up for you on India Business Hour at 9 p.m. Moving on, the finance minister-led group of ministers, more popularly known as the alternate mechanism, met for the second time today in uh, the last five days. After the one-hour-long meeting, Aviation Secretary said that he's confident that the expression of interest for Air India's disinvestment will be made public in about two weeks. Jain Sinha, the Minister of State for Civil Aviation, says in the past that the government wants to divest the Maharaja by the end of this calendar year. The first step is issuing the expression of interest, will, will, which will be taken by June. An official who was also a part of that meeting said the government will be asking the buyer to ensure that employees are retained for at least a year as per the divestment rules. Going by the Secretary's statement, another meeting is in the offing to finalise the special group's decision on how much the government will retain in the national carrier, among other technical concerns. But here's the latest in the debt resolution space. Sources tell CNBC TV 18 that lenders are concerned about the quality of bids placed with JP Infratech. In fact, the Committee of Creditors for JP Infra is meeting to take stock of the latest developments and the lenders are likely to ask all bidders to revise their offers. Ritu joins us now with more. Ritu, what are the key concerns that banks have? That's right, a committee of creditors meeting was held today to review all of the bids that have come in for JP Infratech and revised bids have been asked from all of the players that had shown an interest, including the Kota Cube, JV, Suraksha, ARC, Adani Group, as well as the JSW Group. We also understand that Adani is one of the highest bidders for uh, JP Infratech as of now, but of course these bids are all conditional and will have to be uh, verified. The banks had uh, this argument that the land valuation offered by these bidders is much lower than what JP had offered uh, to the bankers in lieu of debt uh, before the company went into NCLT at about 8 to 9 crore rupees per acre versus 1.5 to 2 crore rupees is what the bidders have offered. So the banks uh, are, or really want them to take into consideration the interest of the home buyers and the farmers as well. This is what has been discussed in today's meeting and hopefully there will be uh, you know, some more talks and negotiations with the highest bidders to see how their bids can be revised better. All right, Ritu, appreciate you joining us. Now, the central government is considering the creation of a special purpose vehicle by NTPC Power Finance Corporation, that's PFC, and Rural Electrification Corporation, or REC. This SPV will operate stressed assets in the thermal power space. No final decision just yet. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC tv 18's Anshu Sharma, the Power Minister R.K. Singh said that he has discussed the idea with the Finance Ministry and perhaps they will move forward. Take a listen. Sir, uh, there's been report that NTPC, PFC and REC will come together for the stress asset. What is the plan and how will it work for stress assets and how much is the stress asset that we are looking at in first, second and third tranche? Uh, this was a proposal by, the, not a proposal, an idea by the REC that uh, 
the CPSUs, including the REC, PFC, NTPC, etc., can get together and form an SPV, uh, which can uh, then uh, run uh, assets which are complete, which are ready to go, but which are under stress, which have been under stress for whatever reasons. Uh, and uh, the quantum which was identified, where the plants are complete and they can be run, is about uh, 25,000 megawatts in, out of that 34 plants, and 15,000 megawatts in the, in the, you know the fresh lot, uh, where some signs of incipient stress are there. That will mean about 40,000 megawatts. Now, th so this is just uh, an initial proposal. This has to be discussed with the Ministry of Finance and uh, the m banking people. And then after that, we'll, once it finds resonance, then we'll go ahead with it. Okay. And the idea is that they will not take over these assets. The idea is that they will run these assets so as to ensure that these are, uh, assets are not sold uh, at, uh, you know, the uh, prices which are much below, I mean, much lower than their uh, appropriate true value. So that, you know, there's no distress sale. Well, that's... That's the power minister there. Meanwhile, after losing out on the race to buy SR Steel, the chairman of JSW Group, Sajan Jindal, today said that his company was willing to enter the fray again, but the committee of creditors didn't allow him to do so. Jindal also ruled out partnering with any other company to put in a bid for SR Steel. So we, we had identified Bhushan Steel as the prime asset, but Tata outbidded us, which is fair. Uh, so, uh, in this case, we wanted to re-enter and we, were to, we wanted to give a very uh, good competition to and, and the creditors would get more money if we were involved. But unfortunately, because they felt that if we were given an opportunity, then they will have to advertise it in the newspapers and they have to call for the bids again. They thought that they don't want to give a new entrant a chance. So they did not allow us, which is, which is okay for us. I mean, if they don't want more money, then it's up to them. It's a public money after all. We were willing to... Uh, participate and give a good fight. Well, that's Sajan Jindal saying that the Committee of Creditors for SR Steel said no to re-entering the fray. Now, just a day after Australia's cricket captain Steve Smith was punished after admitting to ball tampering his IPL franchise, Rajasthan Royals has sacked him as captain. Ajinkya Rahane has now been named the new captain. However, Smith will play for the team when the IPL season begins on the 7th of April. Senior cricketers have spoken out against Steve Smith seeking harsher punishment. But according to the ICC Code of Conduct, he's been handed a one-test match ban and his match fee for the third test match has been docked. Cricket Australia is conducting its own inquiry and is yet to announce any punishment on all the players involved in the ball tampering scandal. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of What's Up. Thanks very much for watching. Bulls making a powerful comeback in trade as indices rally more than a percent. That and more when we return on Markets Today Talkback. We'll see you again in 30 on India Business Hour. Thanks for watching.